Hi, welcome to Entitled to Life, a podcast about healthcare, activism, policy, and politics. My name is Paul Gibbs. I am one of your hosts. And, and I'm Katie Drake. She's our other host. Today, our subject is COVID-19 and school reopenings. So we have actually probably more different, respect, different perspectives on this on this show today than we've ever had on a show before. We have, first of all, we have a teacher's perspective. David Page is a teacher in an unnamed school district in <laughs> Utah. I think we're allowed to say that. Um, David, thanks for joining us. Yep, no problem. And Amanda Robison is a parent with a three-year-old who is in school. And actually, are you doing, you're doing, and the three-year-old at home. A three-year-old learning at home, enrolled in school, but learning at home. And she also teaches private music lessons and is involved in some band and orchestra projects at uh, groups at, at the school where her daughter is enrolled. And then we've also got my good friend, Andrea Sorensen here. Uh, she has five kids who are all in school in the Davis School District, three in elementary, one in junior high and one in high school. And um, Andrea brings kind of a unique perspective because she, uh, her kids are going back to school and everything, but she's also um, dealing with some medical problems in her family that make you guys really wanna be careful about COVID, right Andrea? Yeah, absolutely. We're, my dad is currently uh, awaiting a lung transplant. So definitely something that uh, is a major high risk factor for COVID, so. Absolutely. That's, you know, I, um, I'm a kidney transplant recipient 11 years ago, so I wow. I know the transplant drill with that, but lungs, I would think in particular with COVID, that that is, that that's a big deal, that that would be something that would be something that they'd be extremely concerned about. Yes, yes, absolutely. It, it takes it to the next level, <laughs> so... Mm -hmm. Uh, well, so what we want to do here is just kind of get some different per perspectives on, um, on how people feel about school reopenings, what they're doing to stay safe, whether they're comfortable with the reopenings. We've got people here with some different circumstances and point of views. We're not covering the anti-mask perspective or anything like that because I don't care what those people think. Mm -hmm. uh, but start with David. Um, how many days have you been back at school now? We just finished our second day back at school today. <clears throat> and how, how has it gone so far? Any, any, um, has, any COVID outbreaks at your school? Um, there, before school started, we did have a couple of students test positive who were involved in a sporting program. Um, the, uh, I, I, I felt that, um, that the administration at my school took appropriate action at that point, um, even beyond what the health department recommended. Um, so uh, from that perspective, I, I, I feel like it's, it's a mixed bag, depending on which school you're at. Um, sometimes you're gonna, get, uh, you're gonna get school administration who are really responsive and responsible, I think, in this. And then you're going to sometimes have school administration that are sadly uh, perhaps less responsive um, in, uh, in preventing the spread of COVID. I think you bring up a really good point there, uh, David, that um, I think really brings this factor home too, is that so many of us are in different districts and really every district is doing something different. Um, so that might be something that we all wanna talk about. Um, I'm a parent of school age children myself. This, this is Katie again. Um, <clears throat> I've got a first grader and a sixth grader in the Salt Lake district. We're going all online to start. So that's kind of a, I think we're the only district in the um, state that's doing everybody online. I know several others have that option. So if maybe you guys wanna talk a little bit about that too, about the different options and what, um, kind of how you decided to choose that. And uh, obviously David, you probably didn't get much of a choice in your district, but I'd love to hear from the parents as to what you guys chose and uh, yes, kind of yeah. rationale there. Um, so my daughter's school, um, 
she goes to a local charter school and they had two options. It was either uh, in person and they're splitting up into A and B days. So half of the class goes Monday, Wednesday, half the class goes Tuesday, Thursday. So I, I overheard one of the teachers saying that they have like nine kids in their classroom at most days because it's a charter school they can limit their class sizes i know it's a different different situation at public schools like cutting them in half would be hey lovely but they'd still have like 20 kids in the class <laughs> um but they also had the online only option um which we chose um just because partially because i'm very uh i'm not particularly optimistic that things will be able to stay in class and my daughter has anxiety and the transition to online learning last year was just the pits. So I figured let's start out that way and she's, she's doing okay. <laughs> How about you, Andrea? What are you guys doing? Yeah. Uh, our school district. You're excited about this too in, in your school district, right? About what to <laughs> sorry, what was that? I broke up a little bit. Oh, sorry. I was going to say there was a, I remember there, there being quite a large fight about what the school district was going to do. That was a pretty yes, large situation. Right. Um, <laughs> tensions ran high in the Davis School District recently. It was, it was on the news. Uh, there were a lot of concerned per parents, uh, to be sure, when our uh, district uh, superintendent, uh, as well as the school board, made the decision to do a hybrid schedule. So Amanda, it sounds like we are doing the same thing as your charter school which is two days a week of in-person learning. And then we have three days of online learning. So we have the same, um, they split it up by last name. So if your name is A, your last name is A through M, you attend school Monday, Wednesday. If you are L through Z, you attend Tuesday, Thursday, and everyone does Friday online. The days you're not there in person, you log in with your teachers. And so uh, this was definitely a difficult decision, I feel like, for our district to make. It certainly caused an uproar. Um, I see both sides of it genuinely. I have friends who uh, work full time and have had a difficulty um, figuring out childcare situations. Um, I have many parents and friends who are concerned about the mental health of their students. That's absolutely something that needs to be addressed um, and that we, we certainly need to be aware of during the pandemic. Um, and then on the flip side, you have those of us, as it was mentioned in the beginning of the podcast, um, who have at-risk at risk situations within our homes, whether that be the student themselves or it is a parent um, or a relative, in my case, that that lives with us. So um, those, those matters combined made it really difficult, I think, for them to come to a consensus. So in my opinion, I felt like the Davis School District came up with a compromise. And there were many people who were upset by this. Uh, but the very def definition of a compromise is that both sides will make concessions, right? You've got to give and take a little. And so I really don't know in my opinion, that there was really any other way to go about this. Um, so that is the current situation in our school district. Awesome. It, it really what is a difficult issue because there are lots of different ways ways to look at it. I mean, I I have a I have a, uh, a four year old and an eighteen month old. So the four year old is just in pre K, um, but you know, we're doing it at home because that's what what we feel is is safe. Yeah, it is, is the best choice for us at the moment. But it, even as passionate as I am about about safety and feeling that most things that are open now probably shouldn't be yet, this wasn't an easy decision because it's hard for him. It's the losing the the time with other kids. It, the social development is really not easy for him. It is wearing on him emotionally a lot, and it. It, it is a difficult decision, and this is one where I really can see a lot of different perspectives on this and where see where people are coming from. Yeah. Um, um, did, I, I wanted to ask you, we didn't get to talk about your schedule and what you're going through, and I'd love to hear some more about that and, and what you guys are experiencing. And I know it's only been a couple days, but what are you thinking so far of it? Um, oh, wow. <laughs> so much. Um, uh, 
so my personal experience our, at my at my school we are currently full schedule four days a week uh and then the last day is online only so friday's online only um the problem on my end is it effectively doubles my planning time um and I don't know that we want to focus on this, but I'll say it anyway, because we can edit it out if we don't want to. <laughs> uh, but um, what ends up happening is in a science class, for example, I'll speak from my own experience. Uh, I have to develop things like lab, uh, lab experiments that the students can then do. But then I also have to plan a separate activity for the online students that they can do at home. Uh, they don't have access to the same materials I can provide at the school. So I have to come up with an alternative uh, for them. And then on top of that, I teach three different classes. So I have to do that for three different courses. Uh, so it, it effectively doubles my planning time. And I'll tell you, uh, after two days, I'm already feeling it. Um, I just barely, and I'm not joking here, just barely finished getting stuff ready for tomorrow about uh 20 minutes before i got on this podcast yeah. um it's I, i'm hoping that i'm able to again it's all new i'm hoping i'll be able to streamline as the uh, as as we get moving along um but uh if it keeps going you know at some point something's gonna break and i don't want to i don't want to sacrifice my online kids and not give them the best education that I am able to give them. Um, I don't want to sacrifice the time on my, on my in-class kids either because uh, they deserve the education just as much. Uh, I have different supplies that I can provide them and why wouldn't I uh, use, those, use those resources for them, you know? Um, so what will likely break is my psyche. <laughs> <laughs> um, throws the way there anyway for as long as that's I know true <laughs> <laughs> that's true there wasn't much left <laughs> um, um, in terms of like uh, opening schools uh, like I, I I heard some comments on equity and I I find this interesting um, there's a lot of talk especially in uh, in what I was overhearing in conversations at like the school board meetings in my district but also as I was reading about school board meetings in other districts uh, about this issue of equity. And I find it really, really interesting. Um, the idea being is that, especially in my district, we tend to serve a lot of uh, lower income uh, households. Uh, and they rely on uh, things like lunch service for their kids. They rely on the extra social services provided by schools. Right. They rely on all these services. Um, but I think two things, uh, why, I, I, I wonder why we don't turn around and say, why is it that these families have to depend on school to provide for their children? <laughs> why is it, <laughs> why is it such an essential place for them? Um, and maybe there's something we could address there. Uh, another issue is, and I found this really fascinating, is the surveys in my district. Uh, now, when you're dealing in education, you might, you might or might not be aware of this. The only indicator that we have for like the soci socioeconomics of a neighborhood is the percentage of students who qualify for free and reduced lunch in that area. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what the surveys in my district, and again, I read similar results in other districts, what they found was is that families who are in these areas, these lower income areas, were actually, were actually more likely to favor online school as opposed to in-person school. And that surprised a lot of people, myself included. But then I thought about it and I thought, well, these are families with, tend to be, at least more likely to be, uh, families with two working parents. Um, these are families who are one critical illness away from financial ruin, <laughs> right? Um, they tend to be families who are working minimum wage jobs, sometimes multiple minimum wage jobs, just to support their children. And it, when you look at it through that lens, it makes perfect sense why they would be hesitant to send their kids into an environment where it might be more likely that they would get, uh, that they would get uh, COVID. 
<clears throat> because then they could bring it home. They could get one of the parents sick. And if one of the parents is out for two weeks, that's complete disaster, right? If one of the parents right. is out of work for two weeks. So I, I find it interesting because you can argue it both ways. Like at one, on the one hand, school provides essential services for these folks. Right. But on the other hand, it's also a tremendous liability for some of these folks in, yeah. in a pandemic. Um, and I honestly, I don't know where the answer lies. For my part and my district's part, we do seem to be taking a lot of steps to try and minimize risk. Um, but again, we're walking through the fog here. We don't know a whole lot about how COVID is spread, how easily it's spread. It's only been around six months. Uh, there's a lot of research that still needs to be done, uh, and we don't we don't know for sure if the risk mitigation fact the risk mitigation that we're doing is enough. Yeah. Um, and I I guess I'll I'm, I'll let some other folks chime in because I'll get on a soapbox all day about <laughs> this. <laughs> well, you bring up some great points there, David. Thank you so okay. much. I I agree with what you were saying. I I really think that this has shown that. Um, schools have really become a social safety net for our society and maybe that's not how it should be. Maybe we shouldn't be relying on schools to feed and watch our children and stuff. Maybe there should be other programs that can do that. So anyway, I agree with that. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, guys. I wanted to just climb on my soapbox for a second. Okay. Um, so um, going back to the parents' perspective, um, Andrea, how how are how long have your kids been back? Today was our first day of school. Oh wow! So they started this morning. Um, everybody came home with positive comments. Uh, you know, my my high schooler said it felt a little strange to see everybody in masks, but in the same regard, she also felt safe seeing everybody in masks. So we can, you know, let her tell you her perspective later. Um, but yeah, today was the first day back. Uh, kids were excited and I just, I just believe that our kids are far more resilient than we give them credit for. I really do. I feel like, you know, I'm coming from, again, a district where tensions were level 10 where uh, I, I was adding, being added to groups on Facebook that were, that were advocating um, for, for even prosecution of our superintendent had been considered. Uh, it got very, very heated. And it was, it was really disheartening and disappointing because I couldn't help but think, what message are you sending your children in this moment? I am 100% for teaching your kids to be their own advocate. Um, but I am also a believer of the old adage, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. You don't stop and throw a temper tantrum, but you do what you can to make the best of the situation. And I feel like we can cry all day long that we're disappointed that our children's education will be lacking because we won't have enough academic hours. And yet I feel like we're missing the mark here. COVID's real. The situation that we're living in is not normal and we can't pretend like it is. And what about the lessons in um, community and care and altruism and all of these things that we get to teach our children in this incredible unprecedented time in our history we'll miss that mark we'll miss those lessons if we're so focused on the inconvenience that it provides to ourselves and so for me and my family sure my kids were disappointed to not be at school every day in the same breath they're feeling grateful that they have the opportunity to do what they can to protect their grandfather in this experience. So we've kind of shifted our focus on instead of what do we hate about this to what are we learning for, from this? What is it that you don't like about it? And then let's talk about sacrifice and what it means to put others above ourselves. When you go into that classroom, it's not just about you and your friends and your experience at school. This is also about your teacher's lives and your administrator's lives and the family members of your friends' lives. Um, I just personally think it's something to be taken seriously. I don't take the 
the quality of a life lightly, but I do um, feel like our kids, again, are more resilient than we give them credit for, and we can teach them some amazing life lessons in how we uh, talk about this with them, in how we approach this. So yeah, advocate for your kids, share your thoughts, share your opinions. If you feel like you need to protest the district's decision, whatever, but please, please do so with kindness and with respect and with regard for the community around you. And there's me on my soapbox. <laughs> To that yeah um, I, I really liked um oh gosh now I've already forgotten um something my grandfather always told me um was don't let school get in the way of your education and this I, I always take it kind of different different ways throughout my life and I think this is one of those times where school and the general like structure of it is kind of clouding the fact that we have an opportunity to educate our children in a different way um one of my friends um on facebook uh posted a picture that her daughter drew uh of like they they were doing covid uh education in their class and so they drew a picture of two kids really close to each other with an x over it and then another one with two kids far away from each other with a check mark and she was like why can't we let kids be kids and i'm like well yeah, it's it, um, like part of educating our children and raising children is teaching them how to be responsible citizens. And this is an opportunity to teach them how to be responsible citizens and be generous and humble and um, kind to other people. Absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, um, I was, as you said that, I was thinking of, you know, um, David can be as passionate and sanctimonious about the importance of education as I am about healthcare. And one of his favorite topics, which which he's given really given me a lot to think about, and and I feel like I've learned from things that he's said about this about how in today's society we so often view education as merely being a tool, a pathway to employment, whereas education is supposed to have a higher purpose than, than that. It's supposed to help us learn to become better people and better citizens. And, and what you're talking about made me think about that because yes, there is, there are a lot of opportunities for that through, through mm -hmm. this, this COVID pandemic experience. Yeah. Um, another thing Andrea said was that the kids are a lot more resilient than we give them credit for. They really, really are. They're so much more able to adapt. Uh, another one of JD's, my husband's Facebook friends is a teacher down in the Happy Valley area where all other sorts of things have been going on, protests and things. But she's a teacher down there and she posted on Facebook after the first day uh, that these kids just want it to go away and they will do anything, anything they are asked to just make all this finally end. It's the parents that are freaking out. The kids mm -hmm. just, they will do anything. And that's, that's really impressive to me because huh. uh, you know, when, you, when you said, when you started to say there, they just wanted to go away. You know, I was getting back into the school, of the train of thought that I often have. Of, well, we all wanted to go away, but we have to do, and then you went and saying they're willing to do right. whatever they have to. And that's the problem we're having so much with the so-called adults right now is that everybody wants it to go away, but they just want it to go away on its own without yeah, doing it. They don't want to put in the work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll, no, I'll tell you this. Um, I, I constantly hear people, and I argue this frequently, uh, talk about kids today and what's wrong with them. I working with kids today i am nothing but impressed like they are the most socially aware group of people i have ever been around and Just, that's new to this generation that was that's not the way it was when i was, was, was no it's not the way it was when i was raised i mean they're they're more tolerant of diverse opinions they are aware that their actions have consequences on a larger community other than themselves uh for the most part um, like I have, I, I, I have corrected mask behavior and now granted it's only been two days, 
I have corrected mask behavior twice in that two days. And it was just because they had come in from lunch and they'd forgotten to put it back up over their mouth and nose. It was that, and that's it. Everybody's wearing masks. Everybody's aware of what's going on. And nobody right now is fighting any of the weird guidelines that I, that I've put in place in my classroom or districts or the administration. Like we have, at my school, we have uh, paths that you have to follow. This, just like the grocery store, like you, aisles can go, only go one way, halls can only go one way. And for the most part, students are doing it. And, they're, and when they, somebody violates that kind of policy, it's not usually a teacher who corrects it. It's usually the other students who corrects it. Um, and it's absolutely fascinating and a privilege to watch, to be honest with you. That's awesome. I heard a really interesting thing um, uh, today that was about, uh, I guess yesterday was supposed to be a big protest, No Mask Monday down in Enterprise, Utah, small town here in Utah. And um, all the parents were like, they can't suspend the whole school if everybody shows up without a mask on and stuff. And it was really beautiful, this group of, um, I heard a speech from a cheerleader at the football game on Friday night. Yeah. And she got up and was talking about, you know, we need to do this. We need, we need, we understand even if our parents don't. And um, the principal said, no one, no one who showed up on Monday had a problem wearing a mask. Everybody was doing it. I didn't have to suspend anyone. And I, um, it just gave me a lot of hope for, for our kids. And now I'm going to get cry again. So let's change this topic so I don't cry. Um, what are the things you guys are, finding most challenging? I know like Amanda, it seems like some of the stuff that you're involved in with like music class and things like that, that is hard to do over a Zoom call or whatever. I'm yeah. terrified because my daughter going into seventh grade is signed up for ceramics and PE. PE, I feel like I can do at home a little bit, but ceramics, I'm like, do I have to buy a pottery wheel or like, how does this all work? So tell me a little bit about what you guys are most worried about and what classes you think are going to be most challenging. And, and David, I'd love to hear from you too with some of the units that you think are going to be more challenging or it sounds like a lot of the experiments and things are going to be uh, a little hard. At least for me as a mother, I would be like, you're making such a mess. <laughs> so so um, my daughter's only in first grade right now. Um, it, it has been interesting. She started uh, on Wednesday and I set up a little learning area for her in our house which is rather small but she had a learning area I have my husband some got a big whiteboard for us somewhere I don't even know it just arrived at our home one day so that's been really nice to be able to we do our little calendar thing in the morning and on Tuesdays and Thursdays she has a meeting with her crew leader who does the digital meeting with uh the kindergarten first and third graders who are do doing all digital at our school and then every day uh, in the afternoon she has a digital meeting with her actual teacher and that started uh, yesterday with her actual first grade teacher and they have the option at every trimester break to go back to switch to doing in person so it's just kind of we'll see how it's going my daughter she has anxiety um, and some uh, what, why, why can't I think of the word now? Um, sensory processing disorder things going on. So she, she loved school. She loved going to school. And our biggest issue that we came into when the transition happened in the spring was that she has very, uh, things, certain things happen in certain places. So learning happens at school. Mom is not my teacher. Church things happen at church. Mom does not teach me church stuff dance things happen at dance my favorite song is only when when I want to listen to it so that was very difficult so starting out the school year uh digitally has not been too challenging she does have since she has the freedom we can do recess at any point she wants to take lots of extra breaks so it, it's it's a learning curve but I feel like I have I have an advantage because I have a teaching degree so I have a bit of that and I'm trying going to try to put together like a micro school see if there are other parents in her class with other kids and if we want to do some things together so she gets some of that group interaction but most of her 
all of our other close friends are at school and I'm a little hesitant to do things with them but yeah what else teaching music over zoom sucks but it is what it is <laughs> It sucks so bad. It's so awful. But we're making it work. I do a lot of pre-recording. One of my students, his piano is tuned a whole half step lower than mine. So oh. that's that's really awesome. <laughs> but yeah, that's I, a whole other ball game. <laughs> I, I, I can't even imagine what that must be like. I used to, um, about, probably I, about 19 years ago, I was um, teaching after school drama programs in public schools and trying to some after school drama clubs and at one point actually teaching uh, a, a drama class during regular school hours um, one one day you know one day a week with each class and I just can't imagine trying to do that over zoom you know so music and drama are a little bit different but but it's still there's a in both cases there's a lot of not just talking about it there's a lot of doing it and that is that's got to be yeah. challenging doing that mm -hmm. remote we, we've had to change a lot of our focus we i used to do a lot more technique and stuff with them but it's a lot it's a lot harder to hear that stuff over zoom so now our focus is a lot on music theory and the intellectual side of music rather than getting into the nitty-gritty of technique so, so they're, they're becoming really great sight readers <laughs> that is the end of part one of our two-part episode on COVID-19 and school reopenings we hope you'll join us next time <laughs>